Hello and welcome to day six of the Healing from CPTSD course. Today's module will focus on social anxiety and what we can do to alleviate it or deal with it. This area will actually cover assertiveness and effective communication, free self-expression, self-compassion and inner child work, relational healing, and emotional flashback management from the eight pillars of emotional health and well-being. So right off the bat, the fact that we have social anxiety from something like narcissistic abuse or any other form of abuse from another person or people is perfectly understandable as well as normal. With what you've been through in relation to other human beings, of course you have anxiety and trust issues surrounding other people. Social anxiety is a natural response to being abused, rejected, and treated like garbage by other people. So there is nothing wrong with you per se because you struggle with social anxiety. You just don't want to suffer from social anxiety, nor do you want it to rule your life and hold you back from living the kind of life that you want. So I'm sure that social anxiety is an experience you are quite familiar with from dealing with CPTSD and narcissistic abuse. Not only that, but social anxiety is something that is much more widely understood and experienced by people all over the world, whether they have CPTSD or not. Because of that, we will simply jump right into what to do about our social anxiety to work on alleviating it within ourselves. So the first step to dealing with anxiety is to recall the self-compassion and inner child work we covered in previous modules and simply apply those same techniques to your anxiety whenever you have it. By simply soothing yourself with self-compassionate, loving thoughts the way you would do with a scared child, you will actually be able to relieve your anxiety a great deal. Of course, this also includes slow, deep, rhythmic breathing work as well. Doing this naturally leads into dealing with emotional flashbacks as we've covered, which may come up for you when in social situations. The first thing you'll want to do is simply practice having self-compassionate, loving, soothing thoughts to yourself and your inner child, as well as deep rhythmic breathing in social situations. The next main area to focus on is actually dealing with people in a healthy ways so that we can experience what it's like to not be afraid of others. Remember, not everyone is a narcissist or unsafe for you to be open with or be vulnerable with. Now, as stated in the previous module, if the idea of dealing with people in any way is too stressful for you, it's perfectly okay and you don't have to deal with anyone that you don't want to. However, we all know that we have to deal with even just small basic interactions with others, such as at the grocery store, bank, restaurants, schoolwork, etc., that are difficult to completely avoid. But if we learn how to deal with people in healthy and effective ways, it will become easier to deal with others and your social anxiety will decrease as well. The best way to do this, in all honesty, is to simply practice assertiveness and effective communication skills. You know, growing up with narcissists or other toxic and abusive people, we simply never learned what healthy communication is on any level whatsoever. People like us who have had to deal with an abundance of toxicity and disharmony in their lives have generally only seen and experienced yelling, screaming, fighting, shaming, guilt trips, passive aggression, and all-around rejection and put-downs of both yourself as well as probably most other people in your household. We have learned to be afraid of other people, but we also never learned how to deal with them in a healthy, effective, and empowered way. Learning and practicing assertiveness and effective communication will allow you to do this. And when I say practicing assertiveness and effective communication, you don't have to actually practice this with other people if you don't want to, as touched on in previous modules. Just as a martial artist or musician can practice much, if not most, of their skills completely on their own and so be in a much better position to perform when needed out in the world, so can we do the same thing with our social skills by practicing assertiveness and effective communication on our own. By practicing assertiveness and effective communication, we will honestly be hitting multiple areas from the eight pillars of emotional health and well-being model at once. This allows us to experience a degree of emotional healing by learning to be open and honest with our thoughts and feelings. It is the foundation of practicing free self-expression and ridding ourselves of much shame in the process. And it is also the foundation of relational healing. You'd be amazed how much progress you can make completely on your own if you'd like. 
Practicing assertiveness and effective communication will realign you with your core emotional self. It will allow you to get rid of your shame, anxiety, and is also actually a form of practicing therapeutic flashbacks. This practice will also radically increase your sense of self-confidence, self-esteem, and feelings of inner strength as you finally realize how you can interact with others while being fully present and have the strength to say whatever needs to be said in any given situation, including when it's necessary to set some form of boundaries. Now, also as stated in previous modules, there will be a complete module dedicated to learning assertiveness and effective communication skills, so we won't go into too much depth on how to do that in this module. Here, we will simply be looking at more of the overall theory of it. In all honesty, learning how to soothe yourself inwardly with self-compassion, loving thoughts, deep breathing, and to then learn how to properly interact with others by learning and practicing assertiveness and effective communication techniques is all you really need to alleviate yourself of social anxiety. Some people might feel that they need some form of medication to help with this as well, and if you feel you need that, definitely speak to a qualified mental health professional who can help you with that. But at the same time, learning these skills here will be the primary way to overcome social anxiety, whether you are taking some form of medication or not. I know this might sound a bit overwhelming, but you can definitely do it. And the more you practice with being open, along with being assertive and practicing effective communication skills, the easier all this will become and you will feel much better at the same time. One cool thing is that you can totally practice these skills so that you have them while alleviating your anxiety, inner shame, and empowering yourself and still live a life where you don't have to interact with too many people if you don't want to. It's completely up to you, but even if you prefer to live more of a life of solitude, you shouldn't have to live your life in fear, anxiety, and shame. Now, the other side of social anxiety and learning how to connect with others relationally is in being sure we are doing this with healthy and safe people. The truth is, shutting down and withdrawing from those who are toxic and abusive is precisely what you should do to keep yourself safe. And unfortunately, because there are so many other toxic, dysfunctional, and abusive people out there, trusting people in general becomes even harder to do. Believe me, I know. So the solution to this is to simply not open yourself up to toxic or dysfunctional people or have them in your life at all, and simply learn to be open and vulnerable with people who are safe and healthy themselves. However, until we are able to reach a level where we are attracting safe and healthy people into our lives, we can definitely go to certain places where there are safe and healthy people available. This would include safe and good enough therapists, 12-step programs, or any other group that is dedicated to some form of healing and personal growth. Now, this idea of changing our inner world to attract different things in our outer world was always a bit confusing for me. I mean, I wasn't opposed to the idea that you attract people into your life based on sort of the emotional frequency that you're emitting out into the universe, but the truth is I didn't really know how to stop that within myself. You know what I mean? So, I decided to create another system, yeah I know, I'm a systems guy, that sought to make it easier to see what a healthy person is both for myself as well as others. What I did was, I took a look at people in my life or in the world in general who I thought were examples of really healthy people. And when I say healthy, I mean emotionally healthy, psychologically healthy, the whole nine yards, and I started looking for the common characteristics that all of these people had. The first thing I noticed was how these healthy people made me feel right off the bat. Have you ever noticed how some people sort of make you feel good right away when meeting them or listening to them, while others make you feel bad or on edge or maybe even drained in some way? Well, I noticed that healthy people made me feel great, while unhealthy and toxic people made me feel bad. So my first criteria for gauging whether or not I should surround myself with someone or some people was... How did they make me feel? The next common characteristic I noticed with the healthy people I was looking at was that they had superior mental focus. I noticed that the healthy people I was paying attention to were always highly focused and clear mentally on what they wanted from life, what their goals were, and were also people who were focused on solutions rather than problems. 
And of course, they were also focused on positivity and creativity rather than on negativity and destruction. So my second criteria for whether or not someone was healthy company or not was, where is their focus? The third and final common characteristic amongst healthy people I noticed was in their ability to look within themselves and to take responsibility for their own mind and inner stuff. This means having the ability to take an honest look within themselves, see their shortcomings, flaws, and weaknesses, owning them, and then doing something to change them. These were people who took responsibility for themselves, not just as far as paying their bills and taxes were concerned, but in taking emotional, mental, and even spiritual responsibility for their minds, their lives, and how they interacted with others. I noticed that healthy people do this on a regular basis and continue to grow throughout their lives. Unhealthy people never seem to do this and nothing is ever their fault. You know, like the way narcissists behave. They can never look within and admit any of their flaws or shortcomings and so never grow. And I noticed that this was a common trait amongst many other unhealthy people as well. So I took these three major common characteristics of all the healthy people I looked at being how did someone make me feel, where was their focus, and could they take responsibility for their stuff, and I simply made a number system to create a gauge for myself. You know, I'd say on a scale of 0 to 10, how did or does this person make me feel? On a scale of 0 to 10, is this person focused and solutions oriented? On a scale of 0 to 10, how is this person able to take responsibility for their own inner stuff and work on it? I then added the three numbers up, averaged them, and that would be my score for that particular person to gauge whether or not they were healthy enough for me to be around them. A score of 0 to 1 was toxic, a score of 2 to 3 was unhealthy, a score of 4 to 5 was average, a score of 6 to 7 was above average, a score of 8 to 9 was healthy, and a score of 10 was what I considered to be master levels of health and personal development. You know, like a Tony Robbins type of a character. I then applied this system to my narcissistic mother, who rated a zero for me, as well as other people in my life. This included people in my family, friends, people I worked with, and others, and I began to realize basically everyone in my life was scoring pretty low. This meant that at that time, I was largely surrounded by toxic and unhealthy people. Then I did this on myself to gauge how I made others feel, as well as how I made myself feel, where my focus was on a regular basis, and how I took care of my own inner stuff to see where I fit. And you know what? It was interesting to see the correlation between my personal score and the other people that were in my life. They were pretty similar. However, this did not mean I was a bad person or anything, but rather that I had simply come from a toxic and unhealthy family and learned toxic and unhealthy coping mechanisms, habits, behaviors, relating to others, etc., and then attracted similar people into my life over the years. I realized then that the ultimate secret was to work on my own personal score for feeling, focus, and responsibility, and this would allow me to regularly attract others who were at the healthy levels I was seeking. Make sense? So I invite you to take this little system I put together here and try it out with people in your life as well as with yourself. Then see where you can work on areas within yourself to raise your score so that you become healthier for yourself and others and in turn attract other healthy people into your life. And with that, we will conclude today's module with another simple exercise for the day. So the exercise for today will simply be to practice this social health gauge for ourselves and some of our family members, friends, etc. In your notebook, simply think of a person and write their name down. And then write down, how does this person make me feel on a regular basis? Then simply give them a score of 0 to 10. 0 being the worst and 10 being the best, simply based on your own feelings and intuition. Then underneath that write out, how is this person's focus? Think of whether they focus on solutions rather than problems or positivity over negativity, and whether they are focused in general or more scattered and indecisive. Then simply give them a score of 0 to 10 based on what your feelings are. Finally, underneath that score, write out, can this person take responsibility for their stuff? You know, are they able to take responsibility for their minds and lives and work on themselves or admit when they are at fault? Again, give them a score of 0 to 10 based on your feelings. 
Now simply add up all three scores and average them, and you'll have your social health score for that particular person. And again, a score of zero to one is toxic, two to three is unhealthy, four to five is average, six to seven is above average, eight to nine is healthy, and 10 is masterfully healthy. Just as you ideally want to feed yourself the healthiest foods available for your overall health and well-being, so you'll want to surround yourself with the highest quality people who will be a source of healthy support in your life and who will add to your life and lift you up rather than subtract from your life and bring you down. Practice this with a few people as well as yourself, and I will see you in the next module.